Hello everybody, or uh, the few people watching. Hopefully more people will join in a little bit later. But if not, you know, that's cool too. Just give me a few more because, you know, I, I knew it all of this stuff and I just trying to make sure because we're going to go into some in-depth aspects of the hand ministry. You know, the title of this is Bahamas. Uh, sorry, emancipation and the Bahamas, the good, the bad, and of course the ugly, right? And notice we have two negative categories and one good one. And hopefully at the end of this, you will see uh, why I framed it um, like that as well. What we can do now is um, get right into it, okay? So emancipation, right? We know most of us what emancipation is, but those of us who don't know, emancipation in layman's terms simply means um, freedom, okay? So when we talk about freedom, right? So if I was to uh, say, um, kidnap a group of people and then I release them and I have nothing to do with them afterwards, then I would say that is freedom. Right now, I sure many of you hold the same sentiment that I do that though emancipation has many elements that uh, should be acknowledged and or even celebrated, I would say more so commemorated. Um, it still was, uh, in many ways, a farce um, for our from our perspective and um, not a total achievement of freedom. Okay, so we can delve into that. So, what I can do first, I can start off with the good. Right, so the good essentially being in our contribution to emancipation, not just locally, but even uh, globally. Those that pass through the Bahamas, um, those that uh, you know would have been living here for a long time, and and you know, and I'm not talking about loyalists. All right, so uh, this isn't going to be. Yeah, stereotypical uh, Bahamian uh, rendition of lotion and loyalists all right this is going to be me based on some of my research some of which i've never presented to anybody before so hopefully you will be impressed by it let me know give me your feedback and of course any questions you know uh just let me know i can start off with some of the good and there's no better place to start in my opinion than with a woman by the name of mary prince so mary prince I call her, but we could definitely claim her if we use in this terminology, Bahamian. You know, she definitely passed through the Bahamas. Um, she is considered the first black woman to publish an autobiography in the British Empire. Uh, I don't know special that is, or I should say the first acknowledged black woman <laughs> to, pull, to uh, uh, be published in the British Empire. All right. And she was actually a very, very special woman. And she is also going to be mentioned in the bad section as well. But you would have to stay tuned to see how that comes into play. All right. Now, she was born in Bermuda and she spent a significant part of her life as a young lady enslaved in the Bahamas. And what she did was she was uh, raking salt. Okay. Now, often when we talk about emancipation, they often put people like Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, or people like on an, an the American equivalent being Abraham Lincoln. And especially in Hollywood, you know, they, they represent this rhetoric of these um, white men who never experienced slavery as being the kind of all-conquering heroes for emancipation. We even see it in the movie Amistad, where um, Senke, you know, Senbei Senke, uh, his, his name is completely lost in translation. He has about five lines in the movie. And Anthony Hawkins is there playing John Quincy Adam, again, portrayed as the uh, all-conquering hero in uh, American emancipation, okay? Now, women in general played a very important role in Bahamian uh, slavery and fighting against that more specifically. So in most of our great revolts, I ain't gonna get into it too much now because I can touch on it a little more later. There was always an element 
whether it was between uh, uh, lovers, you know, someone doing something to someone's wife, even in our most uh, popular revolt, the Pompeii Rural Revolt, um, even though initially it was supposed to be peaceful, one of the things that galvanized these rules in Exuma to actually push forward and use uh, samples as a force and you know show their guns was actually when they found out that five of these women um, who were being held in the jail at the time, which is the public library, um, were whipped, and two of them were pregnant at the time. And for about a 10-year period and throughout the 1820s, early um, 1830s, the major argument as regards to reforming slavery in the Bahamas was about um, the banning of the public flogging of women, of women, okay? And the Pompey rural case kind of caused this to, to, to really start to get the ball rolling, all right? So um, now Mary Prince, um, sorry to go back to Mary Prince. Mary Prince went to Britain with one of her masters when she was sold from the Bahamas to Antigua. Okay, and now they had a rule in England that if you were baptized and became a Christian, you would not be able to be uh, pretty essentially re -enslaved. Okay, so when Mary Prince went there, she snuck out in the night and she pretty much got baptized. And she came back um, with the people that actually bought, baptized her and, you know, pretty much did, I uh, was like, I dare you to re -enslaved me. Now, a side note to this is this woman actually abandoned her family and tried to make efforts to bring a family who was in Antigua at that time uh, to join her in freedom. And even after she accomplished this, this woman was really drugged right through the mud. Um, the man that actually baptized her and the people that um, actually published her works, many of them sued each other for libel. And the man that actually helped Mary Prince ended up losing um, many of these uh, significant civil suits, okay? Now on to Mary Hughes. Mary Hughes is a very special case that happened in 1832. Um, and this is pretty much one young lady who beat the living crap out of her slave master, or slave mistress, I should say, and one of her friends, okay? And one of the women, her name is Margaret Wall, and Margaret Wall said this woman put so much blows on her, she didn't know what to do. And now she was dragged before the courts, of course, after being kept in the jail and very harshly treated, most likely whipped uh, to a certain degree, and then she was brought before the courts, and these women testified against her. And she pretty much beat up all uh, two of these women. Margaret Wall was dragged out of the house. After she got punched up, she dragged her down the stairs, fling her down the stairs, and then her friend who was there um, trying to protest the whole situation, who was also very abusive to her in the past, she ran up to her with a clothes fish and punched her directly in the mouth. Now, the magistrates who were in charge of this was uh, Magistrate Anderson, uh, also a man by of Robert Duncan. Now, these were the same men who were famed, um, or infamous, I should say, because these were the men who actually physically whipped those five women that were involved in the Pompey Revolt. You understand? Now, their reasoning, uh, sorry, Mary Hughes was actually sentenced uh, to either death or to be sold away. So essentially, she got deported, and if they ever see you again, we can lynch you. That was the way that that went, okay? So essentially, this all added to this culmination of this notion of the rebellious female slave. And when you look at the parliamentary arguments, and out of the uh, 40 or so parliamentarians at the time, I might have been overshooting out a bit between 30 and 40, only two of them ever really voted for the abolition of the public flogging of female um, slaves, okay? So point number two, I'll try not to take long because I know I can be a uh, long winded at times, is uh, Olada Aquiano, okay? Olada Aquiano is the man who physically, um, actually, literally physically, convinced many of the most famous British abolitionists to actually become abolitionists. So we're talking about men like Thomas Clarkson, and we're also talking about men like William Wilberforce. Some of these men reluctantly joined the abolition movement, abolitionist movement at first. And it's also very important to remember that these British abolitionist movements, Spanish abolitionist movements, French abolitionist movements are just an example of this kind of historical appropriation where you are made to thank the same people that enslaved you for freeing you. You know, it's like thanking a kidnapper for freeing you from kidnapping you, but not 
um, acknowledging the kidnapping, you, if you understand where I'm coming from, okay? Now, a lot of Equiano was the counterpart who came before Mary Prince, okay? And he actually passed away before he was able to see his um, work come into full combination, all right? Now, a lot of Equiano's uh, slave name was Gustavo Vasa, if anybody wants to look him up. Um, now, the interesting thing about him is the Bahamas has actually played or people in the Bahamas has played a very significant role in this man's life. Okay, as a matter of fact, when this man um, came through the Bahamas in the 1760s, they had a storm in his boat capsized. So if you were to read his autobiography, he talks about when he was rescued in the Bahamas. And after his rescue in the Bahamas, a little later, this is when he did all of his magnificent work in galvanizing the abolitionist movements. Okay, so this man was a very, again, important man, like Mary Prince. He was the one that galvanized many of the, the most famous abolitionists. And there's a man by the name of John Newton. John Newton wrote um, the song Amazing Grace, okay? And a lot of Aquiano physically convinced John Newton to throw away his slave trading ways and to come back, be a good human, be a good person and stop his slave trading ways. And if you listen to the song Amazing Grace and the words of it, even though it's in this kind of old English form, um, it's clearly and definitely in praise of Alada Equiano for showing him this way, this truth, and this light. And many of these men use Christianity um, in different segments of the church, different denominations, I should say, that were once for the slave trade and started to shift against the slave trade, okay? Another way we contributed uh, to our own emancipation and globally was through many of the revolts that we had. So to mention one that was on a, a very, very localized level was actually the murder of the overseer on the Pratt Plantation in 1809 on Long Island. I know you all thought I should say Cat Island, but the Pratts in Long Island and Cat Island are very closely linked through the Columbus and the Pratts who through marriage intermingled their slaves and that's how the Pratts in Long Island and Cat Island are um, related not necessarily through family but through enslavement okay but we can deal with that whole great great grandfather versus the slave master uh, notion as well all right so you also have um, the uprising of Golden Grove also known as the Dick DeVoe Revolt also known as uh, the case of Black Dick where they wanted an extra day Christmas fell on a Sunday this day and there was this huge disagreement on which day the slaves would go back to work of course they portrayed like this was the the main cause but when you read into this revolt um, you will also see that there are many other reasons, you know, Dick DeVoe himself talked about how both Joseph Hunter and um, Henry Michael Williams at the time never did anything to benefit um, black people at all. And Dick DeVoe was actually the driver on that plantation and he ended up leading the revolt. Seven people were sent to the Bahamas and five were sentenced to be executed. Governor James Michael Smith at the time, he decided to only execute Dick DeVoe. The reason he decided only to execute Dick DeVoe was because he said that a chain with such feeble links should never be strained. Okay? And when he said this, he was referring specifically to the delicate situation of slavery in places like Kid Island. And places like Exuma a little bit um, later, particularly during the apprenticeship period. And even after the Rose revolted and continued through strategic boycotts that cost um, Lord John Rule lots and lots of money, the neighboring plantations began to follow as well. So you had the Fergusons in 1833 who followed almost in the exact suit as the Rose had did two years prior to them. Okay, then you also have um, Alexander Farquharson right there in 1832 who beat the living daylight to a piece of metal. They had to peel him off of this fella, off of a man by the name of James Farquharson, who was the mulatto son quasi illegitimate mulatto son. He was acknowledging him as his son, but not too much on paper, if you catch my drift, right? And Alexander and James always had this very adversarial relationship. Um, Alexander's wife, uh, James, had taken a very strong liking to him. And to kind of remind James that he was not quote-unquote white, Alexander actually used to call him Jimmy and insult him by calling him Jimmy to say, hey, we on the same level. And Jimmy always used to make passes at one of Alexander's wives. So San Salvador, yes, 
did they did allow um, enslaved Africans to practice polygamy in places like Exuma, in places like San Salvador. And Alec for, and Al, sorry, Alexander, Alec is what they actually called him, but I found out that Alec is actually like a pet derogatory name for the name Alexander, so I'll call him Alexander, right? But in, at the end of the day, his punishment was for him and his wife to be sold away um, and pretty much deported. Now, the wife that they put with him was not the same woman that was involved in the altercation with James Farquharson. So that tells you, um, and other clues throughout the ministry, that polygamy was allowed. This is one of the black loyalist revolts right there in Abaco, all the way back in 1787. Uh, Dr. Christopher Curry's book, um, Freedom and Resistance, in the Atlantic, rural folks around the Bahamas goes really, really deep into this, goes deep into many of our black communities and the black loyalists, the side of the loyalist story that is never talked about. And these black loyalists, of course, the British propagandized it that, oh, well, you know, we liberated, they fought for us and we gave them their freedom. Well, that's not totally true. In 1787, um, this kind of revolt culminated in many of the amnesties that were put out by um the governor at the time, who would have been the Lord of Dunmore, a.k.a. John Murray. And when they put out this amnesty, there were hundreds of black loyalists and free blacks living in the bush on mainland Abaco. This is one of the major reasons why blacks live on the mainland, whites live on the keys. It has nothing to do with them feeling bad for us and giving us no land, as I've heard some oral histories uh, suggest at certain points in time. Okay? Now... When he gave this amnesty, only 30 people showed up, and it was a one man who gained his freedom out of the 30, a man by the name of Caesar Brown. And many of these people had their rifles, had their uniforms that they had served it on the British side in the American Revolution and were still denied uh, their freedom. You also have Quamino, my personal favorite. I ain't give you too much information on him because I'm working on a big project on him, but I'll tell you this. He was a very, he's my fa personal favorite. Um, I guess you could, I wouldn't call him a Bahamian hero, I'd just call him an African hero, because I'm sure he would not have accepted the term Bahamian, he would have accepted the term Akan, but uh, Kwamino uh, was in 1734, his plan was not just to have a slave revolt, because he himself was already free, but his plan was to kill all the white people on the island at that time, starting with Governor Fitzwilliam. Okay, so I'll leave that story right there uh, for now, right? And another personal favorite of mine is um, what they call the French Negro plot, where people like Bethune, Lockhart, uh, some of the other names uh, escape me right now. Um, there was a Tucker. So this French Negro plot was Haitians in 1797 who had planned to bring the same revolutionary ideas that were spurring on in Haiti at the time and conquer the Bahamas and then to absorb um, absorb the Bahamas into that revolutionary fight that ended with the only successful um, slave revolt in the Western Hemisphere, continuously successful, I should say, and that being the Haitian Revolution. That Haitian Revolution, in my opinion, was one of the major catalysts in, the emancip in our emancipation. That was the one that really uh, put it in perspective that we uh, will always refuse to remain enslaved, and the longer that you keep child slavery in place, there will be a time. And by the way, the Haitians defeated uh, the so-called great Napoleon Bonaparte. He pulled all of his generals from all corners of the world to go there and fight against our brothers and sisters down there in Haiti, and many of his best generals, their bones are still in Haiti to this day, right? Now, number four, Maroonage. This is a special one, too. So, bet you didn't know the Bahamas actually had maroons, all right? In the 1780s, before Bain Town was even Bain Town. And many of these people would hide away in a place known at that time as Negro Town. So, many of our, what they like to call free black settlements, free slave settlements, many of these were actually long established, long before they decided to name them after governors like Louis Grant, Grantstown. People who I have seen no evidence of Charles or Alexander being in any heroic sense. Um, I don't know if anyone could point me in that direction, but what I found, if I found that all of these beings, including the mulatto ones, were themselves slave, uh, slave owners. And um, so uh, that one right there really confuses me. 
in a bit, but I ain't gonna dwell too, too much on that. Now, um, another thing is uh, Lord Dunmore's amnesty. So I mentioned the one in Albuco where they were able to suss out a kind of quasi um, maroon society or what they call in French a petite maroon society in the mid, right there in the middle of Abaco. But Lord Dunmore also put out an amnesty for those um, banditos, as they call them, who were living up in Blue Hills. And I find that it's quite ironic that Blue Mountains in Jamaica was one of the strongholds of Maroonage in Jamaica, and Blue Hills in the Bahamas is one of the strongholds in the Bahamas. And this lasted from at least the mid-1700s right up to at least 1823. Ending with a man, another one of my favorite um, African heroes in the Bahamas, being Jem Matthews, 1823. Notice I'm saying African heroes in the Bahamas. Notice emancipation and the Bahamas, because the Bahamas, as we know it, didn't come into being until 1973, right? To quote one of my brothers who I just spoke to, we are still in every way, shape, and form, a baby colonial state. And that is at the root and the crux of a lot of our problems. This is why studying things like emancipation is so important, right? Now, fifth, last but not least, as it says, the Saltwater Underground Railroad. Okay, so during the American Revolution, that proclamation made by Britain, if you black and fight for us, we give you a freedom, was more of a military strategy than any uh, genuine care or love for, the, for enslaved Africans in the Western Hemisphere in any way, shape, or form. And of course, it is um, seen in the fact that they re-enslaved many of these black loyalists when they got here and put in many different stipulations, even for liberated Africans who came, who were big members of the salt, um, big benefactors of the saltwater underground railroad in one way, but many of them had to serve an apprenticeship for seven to 14 years. So I can just mention one or two examples. First one being one of the more popular ones, that's the Peter Morel. The Peter Morel is considered to be the last slave ship to come to the Bahamas, and it landed here, I should say capsized here in 1860, off right there off the coast of Abaco, near Cherokee Sound, on a key called Linyard Key. Okay, this ship came from the Congo, and about 90% of the people on the ship were Africans. Okay, um, this ship was captain by a man named Alexander Smith, with no relation to Alexander Smith here. And after the ship landed, about half of these poor African souls, that I call them right now because that's what they were at this time, who were here, six of them were quarantined, ended up dying right there, uh, I can't remember the name of the key, but there was a key right there, close to Blue Lagoon in them, right? And he and they died there. And they found that many of them were forcefully sent down to the south as a part of their apprenticeship, raking salt. Very similar to the salt raking that you would have seen throughout the Bahamas, right there during the days of slavery. So, again, we have to question this term, emancipation, what it really means. How far do the celebrations, the commemorations go? Where does it stop? And what we have to do after that, okay? Now, another ship that came is another famous one, and it was the Rosa, okay? So, we all know of Adelaide Village. This is another one of those villages where Africans were living around in that area prior to it being established as Adelaide Village. Adelaide, of course, being named after uh, a British governor, a British colonial governor, you know, like they named the rest of them. So Adelaide was named after him. And the people from the Russo were some of the major um, Africans who settled in Gambia Village. And the Russo came from present day Guinea-Bissau, a port called Kashau. I don't know if I'm saying it right. C-A-C-H-E-U. Okay? And that ship came here in 1831, all right? You also have a uh, case. Now, this one was a major, major one. This one was literally about two months before the first emancipation day on August 1st, 1838. And this one is quite interesting, where you had over 1,100 people from Yoruba land, from the port of Lagos, landing here on the same day, May 7th, 1838, on the same day they landed here, okay, on the same day, right? Now, this is very important because we know when we talk about African diaspora, 
Remember, Africa is just not Africa. Africa in itself is very diverse. And even within Yoruba land, it's very diverse. You understand? But this also gives us some clues as to the true nature of what was happening. The names of these ships were the, the Diligente and the Camus. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And one of those, the Camus, sorry, the Diligente, was actually owned by a man named Pedro Alonso Blanco. So not Pedro Alonso, Pedro Blanco. Okay, Pedro Blanco was a Spanish slave trader that lived on the African coast. So again, this counteracts the what I like to call the white man's rhetoric of us kind of oh well, you know, the Africans and slavery. Jail. You literally had these multi uh, million would be equivalent multi millionaire. Um, European tycoons that truly control the trade on this coast. The vast majority of European forts were controlled by Europeans that lived on the West African coast, Pedro Blanco being one of them. And boy, Pedro Blanco hated Africans in the Bahamas because we had cost them a lot of money. The Amistad, Pedro Blanco was the one that sold the members of the Amistad to the owners that then tried to move them from eastern Cuba to western Cuba. And then that revolt in the Amistad actually took place in Bahamian waters in 1839. And this is what gets very confusing because what they love to do is they love to give all praises again to the British Navy for these actions. Now, in 1839, I believe the governor at the time was uh, Governor Cockburn, if I'm not mistaken. Governor Cockburn might have been Colebrook, but I 90% sure it's Governor Cockburn. So I would love, I would really be interested in knowing why was it that when the Amistad revolt happened, when they stopped with New Providence, they were not allowed to land. They left New Providence and then they went west to Andres, between Central and South Andres, off a key. Ah, the name escapes me. It'll come back to me. It's a little key right there, Green Key. A key called Green Key, right off of Eastern Andres. All right? And this key off of Eastern Andres was where the Amistad, the famous Amistad they made the movie about that I just mentioned. This is where they actually went and they got water. My personal theory is that. You know, South Andres, Middle Andres, you know, that's a real black stronghold. And they probably showed solidarity with these men. And then they also stopped the Long Island. And when they went to Long Island, they were also not allowed to lie. The Long Island one actually don't surprise me at all. As we know, Abraham and Monday and Neptune Pratt, as I mentioned earlier, in 1809, they murdered their slave master on the Pratt plantation. In 1835, you had um, Walter Sims, who was murdered in uh, right there in Stella Maris. You know, Stella Maris has that cliff. And one of his people who were up this during the apprenticeship period pushed him off of the cliff. You understand? And of course, we all know that this goes against that whole grain of slavery, that rhetoric of slavery uh, being easier in the Bahamas, which is, I mean, extremely sudden. We shouldn't even be uh, making those comparisons. So to end that section of it, you know, this good part of emancipation came from within. You understand? People like William Wilberforce, who gets all the credit, they would have gained no traction if it was not for people like Mary Prince. As a matter of fact, William Wilberforce was strung out and having withdrawal symptoms from opium at the time when they passed the Emancipation Act in 1833. Who was it that went there and made many of these high pressure speeches? It was Mary Prince herself. Okay? So I'll end there. Now let's move into the bad. Cruelty in Bahamian slavery. You know, as I mentioned before and touched on, you had incidences of cruelty specifically towards females. In the first section, I just wanted to mention a few examples as to how females fought against and the small victories we had, like my personal favorite, uh, Mary Hughes, who beat up those two women at the same time, dragged one down the stairs, who was a slave mistress, and then even though she was sentenced to be deported, James Michael Smith actually pardoned her. Okay? Now, with cruelty now, again, we can take it to Crooked Island. So there's a, lady, there's a little girl, they call her poor black hate. I call her strong black hate. And as a matter of fact, this time period that we're in right now was actually the precise time period in which she was being tortured in 1826. Some historians and history books quote, her, quote, her, quote the event that's happened in 1829, but that is actually when it was published and became popularized in many of the abolitionist journals and newspapers that were 
becoming very popular in England, okay? But essentially, this girl was tortured. She was a domestic slave who may or may not have had relations with a slave master who was Henry Moss and Helen Moss at the time. More on the Moss family later. If you all want to hear an ugly part, I think you all should really tune in for the ugly part because that's where I get to go in, go harm on some of these uh, colonizers and slave masters, right? So, uh, so Kate Moss was essentially tortured for several weeks. Of those several weeks, 19 of those days, she had to um, spend nights in what they call the sweat stalks, okay? They just put you up in a little sweat box, essentially, and they would rub gold pepper in her eyes. Now, she was to find every step of the way, and it was, I could only imagine the level of fear and sickness that those that would have witnessed that, even other um, former uh, slave masters and other sorrows happening and felt very bad for at that time. Now, however, after this, she ended up dying from being whipped. It was so bad that even her father took the whip and whipped her. They tried to betray it that she was so rude that her father had the whip. But what it actually was, was, you know, she was being so harshly treated. You know, if you see your child being beat up and you know this child got to take these licks, a lot of parents would take that whip and try to administer it themselves because at least they know they wouldn't be trying to deliver any fatal blows to the little girl. You understand what I'm saying? So she ended up dying, whether it's from exhaustion, whether it's from sleep deprivation, but she was pretty much tortured to death. All right? And But her story became very popular, and it pretty much became the uh, prerequisite or the, 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 the great example, if you will, for poor treatment of female slaves throughout the English diaspora. All right, made famous by a story called The Cruelty Perpetuated on a Crooked Island, perpetuated by Henry and Helen Moss on a Crooked Island plantation in the Bahamas. And after this happened, you had the who's who of Bahamian loyalists, the who's who of the Lutheran adventurers come into the defense of Henry and Helen Moss. And this had a lot to do with the wealth and the clout and the prestige that their family possessed, not only in the Bahamas, but all the way over there in Liverpool. we get to that in the ugly section. Henry and Helen Moss, Crooked Island, Auckland's on the whole, many of these people were raking salt. Salt was the major pro um, contribution to what you call the European market. Haiti was famous for sugar. Virginia was famous for tobacco, cotton. The Bahamas was famous for its hardwoods, its dyewoods, and most of all, its salt. Bahamian salt was also traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Now back to Mary Prince. In Mary Prince's life, she wrote about her life being on salt plantations in the Bahamas. She wrote about the torture and death of old Daniel. She wrote about how these people, and when you read this, you will see names like Duncan, you will see names like Darville, you will see household Bahamian names. You will see names like Stubbs. You will see household Bahamian names that are involved in these stories. So this is us we're talking about. They're saying, they're saying them. This us. Okay? Now, her story, she speaks about old Daniel. She speaks about a little bit of sexual abuse. She speaks about the nature of being on a salt flat. So notice how many of these islands in the Bahamas, they have a settlement called Salt Pond. Most famous one probably being right there in Middle Long Island. Salt was traded in the New York Stock Exchange. Salt was used in the dreaded uh, Trail of Tears used um, in America. Okay, so it's important to know that these things happen. All right? Now, <clears throat> you also have the case of Sheila and Flora Dames. And this had to do with, of course, Charles Dames. And we'll get into him some more, too. And then you also had Henry and... Nathaniel Adderley, and all of these guys were involved because these women, they all owned different plantations, mostly dealing in salt. Dames, as a matter of fact, was one of the major beneficiaries of the salt plantations that you see on uh, an Adderley as well, on Little Exuma. Okay, and to this day, you still have the salt beacon standing there on Little Exuma. To this day, you would still go to Bennett Harbor and look at the salt, um, the salt pond in Bennett Harbor, that, that the red, they call it the Red Lake. You understand? And it still has some of the grids, the salt ponds, as they were called, that would date back to the days of slavery. Sheila and Flora Dames. Um, Flora actually snuck out in the middle of the night to go and see James and Michael Smith to tattle on these men. And what had happened was they had sent Sheila, who was pregnant at the time, to the workhouse. 
the workouts being the jail, pretty much the workouts was you go to jail and you send this to hard, hard labor. Now, it's a little scant as to whether she purposely miscarried or the hard work that she was doing miscarried, but this is just one other small example of the cruelties that we have suffered. And of course, in most of these incidences, you will find that cruelty was directed at women. Also, men too. You have the case of Ben Moss, again, owned by Henry uh, and Helen Moss. This man worked hard, raking salt, raising cattle, picking cotton, right there in Crooked Island, all of his life. When he reaches elderly years, the man, uh, and he was also working on people's ships, in some cases, you had people who would give you one little shilling for waking all day on their ship if you was a slave, and they'd get on the side, and then, of course, the slave master was the one that made all the money from your labor. So that's another thing. You didn't even necessarily have to own slave. Your cousin, your brother, your uncle could own the slave. Hey, uncle, I got a fence I want to build. Send five of your slaves down here, and you get free labor. So this is how these things work. Just like in, in uh, everywhere else, that was a child slave colony. Um, at the time, okay, so Sheila pretty much miscarried because of this harsh treatment, and it was she was whipped and all of these things, and she was known to be pregnant as well. Um, you have the example of Emmanuel. This was in um, 1791, okay, and Emmanuel, he, all he did was he stole a boat. Um, it isn't even really clear if he was trying to escape from slavery, if he was just trying to get away, or if he was going to see somebody. But he stole a boat and went right there to Highburn Key, right there in the area of Blue Lagoon and Rose Island. Uh, actually, sorry, it was actually a part of the northern Exuma Key, it's Highburn Key. Not too far away, so he didn't even leave this boundary. And for stealing this boat, um, he was actually hung. And his body was hung up as an example to other slaves who would try to steal boats to escape. And this was in 1791, and his body was hung up right there in the harbor for weeks and weeks his body decomposed being hung right there in the harbor as an example most of those that were executed in that way that's what happened you understand neptune monday and uh abram pratt who murdered their overseer in 1809 and the plant they, they were also executed dick devoe was also executed and even after Dick DeVoe um, died, you know, there was, even then you had these fairs of African culture. So, of course, in Kid Island, you know, they talk about Obi and Kid Island and all these things. And there was a widespread rumor that, that an Obi man or Obi woman in Kid Island had somehow restored Dick DeVoe to life. <laughs> right? So, I love these uh, stories, especially when it has to do with these European fairs of Africanness and and evidence that shines through of the ways that we would actually use these fears. Um, so while you had, unlike in America and, and in the United States and Barbados, where you had so many people that own hundreds and even in some cases thousands of slaves, um, you still had a very dire situation. As a matter of fact, some historians would, would actually tell you that some of the slaves that were on some more profitable plantations were better off in some situations than slaves on poor plantations. So for those of you who may be familiar with um, the, the roots, the first one and the second one, Kizzy was Kunta Kinte's daughter. Kizzy meaning stay put. Kizzy was uh, sold away to a man named Tom Lee, an Irish man named Tom Lee. Tom Lee was a drunkard, impoverished man, not a big business man. So without proper historical interpretation, it would be very easy to assume that because she wasn't on this big mega plantation and made all this money, that things were much easier for her. But it was actually quite the opposite. Because she was one of the few slaves that this man owned, he took particular notice to her. And she was raped all the while. Her own son was a product of a rape between her and her slave master, something that was extremely common in the Bahamas that I'll touch on more in the ugly section. Okay? But these things are things that we have to acknowledge. You know, we never even really sit down together and cry about this. You know, that might sound silly, but this is this is real. If you think about the African diaspora globally and in the Bahamas as a human, as one human, and you think of a human that's been through so much trauma, and you just bottle up all that emotion, you ain't even cry because this man did this to you, you never even, so what we, we never even do these things, so this is why it's important to acknowledge the good and the bad, and of course the topic today 
there's emancipation, so that's why I haven't done my usual starting in Africa because our history does not start with Africa. It does not start with slavery story. It starts in Africa. You understand? Our history in the Western Hemisphere, in the Bahamas, starts with slavery. And the majority of our history in the Bahamas still is us as chattel slaves. So that's another thing to think about, all right? So Daniel McKinnon. And Daniel McKinnon's account uh, gives credence to a lot of these, um, prop, a lot of this propaganda that kind of came in with this. So this whole paternalistic attitude of benevolent slave masters and stuff. So this guy went all around the Bahamas, stopped, he spent a lot of time, for example, in Crooked Island and Auckland, where he bragged about these innovative slave masters and he bragged about how happy this female slave in Crooked Island was because she picked so much more cotton than everybody else. You understand? So at the same time, while this man was trying to imply that slavery is such a successful business in the Bahamas, he avoided the island of Anagua. The reason he avoided the island of Anagua because the island of Anagua was populated by a man by the name of, uh, I believe his first name is William, but he was definitely a Cartwright. And this Cartwright fellow took many of his slaves down there to Anagua, and he's one of the first people. And even this pro-slavery advocate with this paternalistic attitude identified Cartwright as a villain. And it's just this continuation of this rhetoric of, quote-unquote, it's better in the Bahamas, you know, we didn't have it as bad as our neighbors to the south. And um, so, truth, you know, our entire educational system is grounded in that, you know, the de-Africanization of us. That was a concerted effort, you know. So they show you the one side where, oh, look, they wanted to educate us, they wanted to teach us. First of all, they wouldn't tell you that places like the Kingdom of Mali, just the Kingdom of Mali, even during slavery, even after its zenith, had more writing scripts than Europe. In Europe, they used generally one writing script, and that's the Latin writing script. And in Mali, they had numerous writing scripts. It's pretty much, you know, the old artist that history is written by the winners. And unfortunately, we've adopted much of this. And again, we have also mistaken that British paternalistic attitude for benevolence and care. Now, in our defense, I will also say that the entire diaspora, even to this day, we were in survival mode. So I don't, I don't like to really label this one and that one as a sellout. You understand what I'm saying? I don't like to to use those labels, particularly in a time where I did not live in. So while we could look back in hindsight and criticize things that many of our leaders may not have done, most famous of which being Lyndon Pinlin, people always criticize him, well, you know, he should have do this, he should have do that. Let's not forget that Lyndon Pinlin came into power right in between the death of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, Patrice Lumumba and Fred Hampton. You understand what I'm saying? Even to this day, even in our modern history of Thomas Sankara in 1987, any person of African descent who is truly and utterly and unequivocally for the improvement of African people, they are slaughtered like dogs. You know, and history has proven that. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. So us being in this survival mode is not acknowledged. And we love to talk about black crab syndrome, crab in a bucket syndrome. Americans call it crab in a barrel syndrome. And to that, I would say... I acknowledge it, but I would also say this. Crabs do not live in buckets. Crabs do not live in barrels. Who put the crab in the barrel, who put the crab in the bucket is the real man to blame. Once those crabs are now outside of their natural environment, they used to live in one way. Now they got to live another way. And this is forced on them. They have no choice. So now you end this barrel. This barrel being the Westminster system, capitalism, um, uh, racial wealth disparity, the whole night. You understand? Now, we don't live in this barrel, so now that we're in this barrel, we are in survival mode. And we have never left that survival mode. And so, when Lynn Pendon looked to his left and see that one get killed, and he looked to his right and see that one not killed, I can understand why, even though I wish he didn't do it, but I can also understand why he was kind of, as I like to say, one foot in and one foot out. As you saw with Kwame and Kuma, one foot in, one foot out. A lot of it was through naivety. A lot of it was through fear, you know. Um, and I feel that Lyndon Penland was probably a combination of the two. Lyndon Penland's father, and a lot of the reasons why a lot of people didn't like him, including the, some of those that left the PLP, was not because, as they tried to display it, he was so overtly corrupt. He was no more 
corrupt than the UBP government that he had just overthrown. Far from it. Lenin Pillen himself was from, his father was from Trelawney. You understand what I'm saying? And Trelawney was formerly known as Kujo Town. The same Captain Kujo I mentioned earlier in the video. So Lenin Pillen himself and his patrilineal lineage is directly descended from these Akan warriors, from these Akan heroes that pop that people the Western Hemisphere. And let's get into the ugly. Okay, now the ugly. Emancipation resulted in the ending of chattel slavery. Did not end all modes of slavery for us. I think that's clear. In the Bahamas, we had, and I like to make these comparisons to um, uh, the United States, because the United States, the racism and the systems of oppression in the United States are more readily ingrained into the psyche of the African diaspora. So when you make parallels with the United States, it's much easier for people to understand. Right after slavery, we also had our equivalent of what was the Reconstruction, system, Reconstruction era, right? And then we moved into another era that a lot of historians like to call the truck and credit system, also the line tenure system. And these would be the Bahamian equivalent, equivalents to the Jim Crow era, to the Reconstruction era. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if you watch the documentary on Netflix, the 13th, they talk about the 13th Amendment and laws were passed that were specifically geared um, and disproportionately affected people of African descent. And you had the same thing here in the Bahamas with something called the vacancy laws. You know, more than four people weren't allowed to gather. Blacks weren't allowed to gamble and all of these things. Many of our industries that we like to pride ourselves on, in actuality, we really shouldn't. And I'll be frank with that. Industries like the pineapple industry, particularly the sponging industry, certain aspects of the salt um, industry, and many other ones, right? So just to give an example, uh, let's use the sponging industry. We all know the family groups that run the sponging industry. Many of these Greek families still own the buildings where the spawning industry took place. And they even own some of the other buildings they there on Market Street, buildings right there on the corner of Marlborough Street. We know this, right? Not one black Bahamian owns a single building in the main area of downtown. One or two of us own on West Bay, and two of us own on East Bay Street. So that term Bay Street Boys still applies. And there's no such thing as a black Bay Street Boys, at least at least not yet, to my knowledge. This truck and credit system, as he's using the Spanish you did, they did something called paying in kind. So I would give you your clothes, I give you some food and some water. Now there's a man, a magistrate who was here, never spoken about the Bahamian industry. This man has given one of the most scathing reports on Bahamian society, and he was here 50, 60 years after Emancipation Day. So this really puts it into context. And he talks about how Greek families, some of your most well-known families that are connected to your household trading names like that. These people were entrenched in the truck and credit system. The Greeks used it. They would pay you in kind, give you some money. Then, of course, now I'm coming on your boat to pick sponges. And when I come on your boat to pick sponges, I come in on your boat already in debt. Okay, so I'm ready on that. You give me some clothes, you give me some food and some water. Magistrate um, Powell, he said that most of the times we were swung so hard, and he was behaving terminal, we got swung so hard that the clothes and, and the food they gave us wasn't even good for, for even the vagrant's cabinet. And the first thing we do as soon as we got these needless little trinkets from these um, people that we were taught that we should thank for founding some of these industries, industries that they came and met here, you understand? They just exploit us at every turn. So I owe you money, I come on your boat. Then of course I gotta pay for water, I gotta pay for food, I gotta pay for clothes, I gotta pay to use your tools, I gotta pay to do all of these things. So at the end of the trip, who you think owe who money? I owe you even more money. Then of course when I land, I have the law, my cousin is the judge, my brother is the thing I'm, my baby mother is this one. And he also spoke about the physical abuse that still didn't go away since before emancipation of white behemoths striking black, female, black women in the face regularly. And this same magistrate powers, he was actually kicked out of the Bahamas for trying to charge um, one of the sons of one of the most prominent light-born traders. 
You understand what I'm saying? And he tried to prosecute him for throwing his maid out the, um, off the steps and slapping her down and kicking out the house and constantly abusing her. Humanity. Okay? Now, he was kicked out of the Bahamas for merely trying to prosecute this man, giving him a, a jail sentence of about one month for something that he would probably get... Uh, Se at least several months for it. If you ask me, she get several years for it. Um, that that uh, consistent beating up on our African sisters, sisters of African descent um, in the Bahamas. Okay, so almost without exception, every member of that oligarchy could be unequivocally traced back to significant slave owners and movers and shakers of Bahamian society who benefited and contributed to the mass, who benefited from and contributed to the mass disenfranchisement of Bahamians. Isn't that ugly? If you look at the Dennis Seminet plantation, you will actually see that many of these slaves were mulattoes. A lot of people don't really grasp this concept and what this actually means. What this actually means. Now, the term mulatto in the Bahamas was very loose. It wasn't as stringent as it was in Haiti, meaning that mulatto specifically meant white mother, black father, or vice versa. However, mulatto did mean that you could pass as a, as a mulatto film. Typically, you were light enough skin, maybe you had some brown, green eyes, and stuff like that. Now, when you look at the plantation of Dennis Simonet, you see that so many of these people were mulatto. What was he doing? These men were having sex with their slaves, having sex with the slaves of their friends, having sex with the slaves of their brothers and their cousins, and enslaving their own children, enslaving their own um uh, nephews and stuff. You understand what I'm saying? And the thing about this is, unlike in the United States, when you look at the plantation, you could see a hierarchy on the plantation that is almost directly correlent with the shade of your skin. So the lighter you are, you know, you go into the house and these things. In the bombs, you did not see that. So that's a really, really disturbing thing for me right there. Because you don't see no separation. Right now, they are moving into my next point is about black slave owners in the Bahamas. Now, in my research, what I've seen the vast majority of black slave owners in the Bahamas were the legitimate and illegitimate children of slave master slave relationships, as you see with James Fox in San Salvador. As you see with my own ancestry, Margaret Clark, the daughter of either. Jacob or George Davis. George Davis being from and the slave master and uh, former slave master, you say he ended up leaving in Bari Tari, Exuma, you know, they say the Davis is from there. And then right there in Old Bay Kid Island, you had Margaret Davis, who was identified as a free woman of color, her father being Jacob or George Davis, who had a child with a slave. You understand what I'm saying? And she was the last slave owner of the Davises right there. However, out of my patient, she had only owned six slaves for which she received compensation for. People who were brave like Elijah Morris were brave enough to actually stay and settle right there in um, Gambia Village. And the vast majority of Morrises, I'd say all that descend from Gambia Village are descended from the rowdiest guy in the most successful slave revolt in United States history. All right? Well, that one's not too ugly. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty one right there for me. Now, back to black slave owners. You also have Samuel Mintz. Samuel Mintz was the son of a woman, a Congolese princess, by the way, by the name of Rosette Mintz, who rescued a man named John Mintz by fastening him to a mattress and swimming two miles and towing him to shore. And this woman gave birth to uh, many people in British society that became very important. Me personally, I have a lot of misgivings about the family, even though the initial story of how they came together can be deemed quite beautiful, but there's a long time when John Mintz owned Rosette as a slave, and then his own children were owned as slaves as well. And then Rosette and John bought slaves for their children. Okay, so this brings me into my next point to close this point out. There's a man named Wilson Armistead. It's another guy you could Google. A lot of my information is out there. You could Google him. He wrote a book called uh, A Tribute to the Negro. Now, if we used to read this book in 2020, it will seem quite passive. It will be very tame, and it will even offend you. But you have to know the context. This, this book was written in, 18, in the 1840s at some point. And this book was meant to show the overtly racist uh, European that we are pretty much human. And he wrote about Rosette Mintz. And when he mentioned how Rosette Mintz 
what they call made her children freeholders. He said that it was typical for free blacks to quote unquote buy a slave for their child because it was that was the only way that you could guarantee that you yourself would not be re-enslaved yourself, as was done with the black loyalists, as was done all throughout. And we have several cases of um, Bahamian seamen hiring out um, Bahamians of African descent and taking them to Cuba and selling them into slavery to work on sugar plantations. Some of them even spent a number of years there before finally being uh, returned to the Bahamas and reunited um, with their uh, families, okay? Bahamian now, slavers. So I'm not talking about slave owners. I'm talking about fellows that own slave ships, that captain slave ships. I don't have time to get into that too deeply, but remember I mentioned the Moss family. So Thomas, James, they were brothers. James's son, sorry, little brother or son, excuse me, but they were all immediate family members. Now this Moss family is one of the most prominent and wealthy families in Liverpool. And the vast majority of these slave ships were based in Liverpool. Slavery turned Liverpool from a little small fishing village into the richest city in Britain. If it ain't the richest, the second richest. Okay, so I don't think people really fathom that. And when you realize that Liverpool is one of the economic hubs of the, not just England, UK, the British speaking world, and how slavery is intertwined in that, and how Bahamian slavery is even intertwined into that. That's when we really have to start asking these questions about emancipation. You understand? Because remember, the slave master was compensated. Even these people from the Saltwater Underground Railroad, the Rosa, they were compensated. Even in the case of the Creole in 1855, these people were compensated. You understand what I'm saying? So these are all things that we really have to acknowledge and stop running away from. Now, the ship that they owned, one of these ships was called the Speedwell, and the Speedwell landed here in 1790. For anyone who want to check me on that. And this was owned by Henry Henry Moss. And this money was used into the founding and to the establishment of businesses like Moss & Co. that's still standing there today in England. The railroad they have going from Liverpool to Manchester was built by John Moss. John Moss, after the death of Henry and Helen Moss, he inherited, sorry, after the death of the one in Guyana and Henry Moss, he is the one who inherited many of these um, slaves. And that money and the compensation that he received at emancipation went into building the capital for this, okay? And then in 1790 and in 1791, on a ship ironically called the Governor Dowswell, they brought in even more um, slaves. And roughly it was about 250, between 180 and 250 slaves, somewhere around there, that um, this Moss family had brought in. So another um, slave trading uh, bohemian, if you will, is a very famous loyalist, one that is uh, always, um, and remember that Moss family is the same Moss family that uh, where the, the incident with um, strong blockade happened, the incident with Ben Moss, the old guy who worked all his life to free himself, only to be whipped pretty much to death in the most petty of ways. You know, they found the smallest infraction and they were just angry that this man was able to save money somehow and buy his freedom, whip the man to death. You understand? Now, Charles Dames is a famous loyalist, okay? And Charles Dames uh, is the one who a lot of people, like they say, like to lotion the loyalists, right? And he's one of those who would find him in so many history books, you know, in the middle scant, little dealings of his slave dealing is always there. So not only was he a very prolific slave owner, a very prolific producer of salt, I mean, his plantations were, you know, literally hell on earth, he also physically brought slaves into the Bahamas, all right? So we had a ship called the Sally, and the Sally was a common ship that was always going back and forth, always doing business, always trading in salt. You understand? And this man was absolutely brutal as well, okay? I don't want people to think that this wasn't just like you would see in a movie with the slave ship, right? Now, he owned a, side that, he owned a ship called Sally that made two trips in 1785 and in 1786. 
both in both these cases, he bought 80 slaves and 58 slaves from Kingston, Jamaica, and brought them here. Right? So you have the case with Thomas Morris, who brought them from Africa, and then you have the case um, with, with Charles Dames, who physically brought them here. Okay? Now remember, it's the same Charles Dames who used to own Florida, and Sheila Dames, who worked them so who tried to work mom so hard that she had a miscarriage, and then sent her to jail in the workhouse to do hard labor just because she didn't work and do the thing even though she's pregnant and she ain't meeting a quota. All right? Now we had another slave ship called the Live Oak. Live Oak, okay? And this one came a little later in 1786. And now this ship brought 50 slaves. Now it doesn't seem like 50 slaves is a lot. However, this ship only had 15 tonnage. 15 tonnage. So imagine crime, crime that's like that's almost like cramming 50 people on a on a on a big scarab in the hull of a big scarab. You understand? And that slave ship came from Georgia. This is separate and apart from the slaves that he already owned and came and brought when he got his exorbitant land grants in places like Little Exuma. You understand? Places like Big Exuma places like Long Island, and even places in New Providence. You understand? These men were not good men. These men were not made to be praised in any way, shape, or form. You understand what I'm saying? We could acknowledge things that they did. Oh, John Wells built this nice newspaper, okay, but he also owned slaves. So what, when do we put the suffering and the death of our ancestors? When does that take precedence? Instead of trivial things like newspapers, and caught, you understand? Now, last but certainly not least, and I think this one might surprise a few people, but the Rogers family. Yes, talking about Woods Rogers, his son, William Redstone Rogers. Woods Rogers was a prolific slave trader. As a matter of fact, his moniker, expel pirates, restore commerce, remember that? When he say expel pirates, restore commerce, what he really meant was make the pirates work for us and restore commerce meant turn the Bahamas into a slave colony, which is exactly what it became. Now, he owned, he was involved in several slave voyages, and he and his family is from Bristol, and they were involved in the early slave trade, and he learned his seafaring through the Bristol slave trade. So that's number one. Number two, he took place, he took um, uh, part in the transatlantic slave trade even before he became the governor of the Bahamas, and he did so while he was the governor of the Bahamas. And in 1730, he had a ship called the Nassau, and that brought in hundreds of slaves that came in here, sorry, 150 or so slaves that came in here from uh, quote unquote present day Gold Coast. Ironically, the same region where our hero, John Canoe, was fighting out of. Okay, so we gotta ask ourselves these things. So when we talk about the, the quote-unquote days of piracy that they talk about were so bad, blacks in this space had a lot more autonomy. As a matter of fact, Milo Butler was not our first black head of state. A man by the name of Red Elding was our first head of state, and that happened in the 1690s during our so-called days of piracy. And as we move closer to being a baby, as my brother like to say, a baby colonial state, as we move closer to being a baby colonial state, that's when you see the racism, the vice whip of white supremacy, get tighter and tighter and tighter, not only in our physical lives, but in our psyche. You understand what I'm saying? So it's important to know how we contributed to this wealth, as I touched on earlier as well. Right? So I'm going to give a few more examples. Uh, as I close, right? And I promise it's the last section here, right? So we have to realize that a lot of these same families, as I mentioned, who have always been in control, the slave master, you know, many of them left afterwards, after slavery, just as many whites left the Bahamas after majority rule, just as many whites left the Bahamas after um, independence, just as many whites left Coral Harbor as black started the movement, just as many whites left White Grove, <laughs> White Grove, that used to be a coconut plantation owned by the Adderley family, White Grove, much as many of the white people left White Grove, and now mostly black people live there. So this white flight racism thing is real in the Bahamas. And there's almost no aspect of racism 
um, that you would see in your, you know, stereotypical American Southern racism that you would not have found here. So when we look at the roads, you know, they like to call the road an absentee, you know. You know, the, 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 the road slaves had a lot of free time and all this. And people don't really realize it's just the fact of you owning slaves, in a sense, produced with wealth in itself. You understand, as a matter of fact, the Pompey Revolt happened because he was trying to move to Naked Island so that he could rent them out to Carolyn Thurston, right there by Strong Sill and Thurston Sill in, in North Kid Island. He wanted to rent them out to, to the Thurston family so that he could get the money from their labor. All right? And now the roads, all the way back to Dennis Road, these men built mansions in England and a canal called the Royal Canal that was very significant in irrigation right through the 19th century um, for that. And this was built off of the slave labor, off of the sale, off of the kidnapping of our ancestors. And me, myself, I'm descended um, from the Royal family. That none of these countries, United States, England, France, Germany, even the ones that we love to praise, Sweden, Denmark, oh yeah, them too, Holland, all of these ones, all of them would be nothing without the absolute degradation and oppression and the theft of African people, way of life and minerals, and the way that we built these things. When they say the lawyers build this and the lawyers build that, the lawyers ain't build nothing. They sit down on the porch drinking lemonade while we did the work. That's what happened. You understand? And we have to take this attitude. And not only did not only did we build the Western Hemisphere for these people for free not only that but they were then compensated for our emancipation and how did the british government pay for this but we always do this mental gymnastics to give praises where it's not due you see it with Wish rogers we got a statue of Wish rogers that's actually facing inland which is a huge insult the statue facing inland I don't know who responsible for that, but the only people that supposed to be facing in the sons and daughters of the soil of where that statue is. All right, so let me close this out. Yeah, Rothschild's family were the ones that gave uh, the British government, Queen Victoria at the time, the loan that was required to compensate every slave master. The hymenology uh has a document on it as well but i don't think they have all of the records but if you were to review it's another thing you would google if you would review the compensation records for bahamian slave owners it's literally the who is who of bahamian families like you will see all your who is who of uh, bahamian families are in there now this loan that the rothschilds received they were actually considered philanthropists for doing this making money off our enslavement you understand well, even physically owning slaves in the Bahamas and that man made more money than all of them. You understand? And of course, you know, the Rothschild's family is literally arguably the wealthiest family, even wealthier than the royal family themselves. You understand? Based mostly in these most nefarious ways that they did business. The British government did not finish paying back this loan to the Rothschild's family until late 2016. So see, this slavery thing is something that's so long ago. Oh, we need to forget about it and move on. So for those of you all who are trying to trace your roots back to specific plantations, those of you who are looking for reparations, those of you who um, who are, you know, because we all have the same stories. As I mentioned, H.G. Christie teeth line from my ancestors, and I ain't ashamed to say that. You understand? So we have a lot of these stories about the Sankofa Flamingo, it's right there on Facebook, and you could book on Facebook or on my uh, on my Gmail. I appreciate those who tuned in. Share the video, chop it up into pieces, do whatever you want to do with the video. It's this for us to do. Make sure I like our page, Brain Food Two Four Two. Make sure I like the page, Brain Food Two Four Two. Make sure I like the page, Sankofa Flamingo. Uh, peace and love, everybody, and uh, take care. Share the video. Like the page. Thank you.